Oh, welcome to the beginning of John chapter 6. I called this section A Meal with a King. It's obviously a really well-known story, um, the feeding of the 5,000, but it really is an incredible story for us to dig into. So let's not let familiarity with this story cause us to not dig in and delight in the truth about Jesus that we learn in this section of God's Word. As always, I do encourage you to read the story a few times. Familiarize yourself with John's version of the story because this is uh, one of the miracles that's recorded in all of the Gospels. Uh, So all of the Gospel writers have different uh, emphasis that they place in the story. And one of the key things that John is wanting us to know about Jesus, to be sure about, is that Jesus is God. And in this story, we see how he he shows us that Jesus is indeed God. And so I encourage you to just read through the story a number of times for yourself. Um, As I said, familiarize yourself with the story. You could also go and read Exodus 16, which is the story of God's people um, in the wilderness, hungry, um, Moses leading them and needing food to eat and God miraculously providing them manna in the desert. And I think that is really useful Old Testament background to just read and familiarize yourself with that story a little bit. So go and read Exodus 16, maybe pause the video, read this passage a few times and spend some time praying, asking God to help you to understand his word better for yourself, that this wouldn't be what we saw last week at the end of chapter 5, that it wouldn't be merely studying the word, because we think that in the word we have life, but rather seeing that this word of God points us to Jesus and delighting in what we see in this passage about Jesus. One of the tools that I used in this section, what is is known as the narrative plot arc, where you are looking for your setting. In a good story, there's a conflict that builds. You look for your point of climax in the story and then from that point seeing how the story resolves before being given a new setting. In this story, so verse 1 uh, gives you your clear um, setting. So Jesus is no longer in Jerusalem like he was in chapter 5. Now he's back in Galilee where he was in chapter 2 where we saw uh, the wedding in Cana of Galilee, Jesus is back there again. And the conflict builds in verse 2 to 9 as we see this great crowd uh, coming and we find out that they are a hungry crowd. And Jesus asking the question to Philip is growing that conflict. How are we going to feed this crowd? The climax comes in Jesus' miracle as he gets this crowd to sit and he feeds them. And then the story resolves itself. So first the conflict is there in verse uh, 10 and 11. And then the story resolves itself in verse 12 to 14. Um, The magnitude of the miracle is seen in what was left over. Um, There's 12 basketfuls of leftover from just a a few uh, loaves and a few fish. And then the new setting, verse 15, uh, Jesus withdraws so that the crowd won't make him king. The time hasn't yet come um, and they don't yet understand exactly what kind of king he is. So trying to work out the narrative plot arc in a story like this is always a useful tool. And then we want to look for um, key transition words. Um, So sometime after this shows we're in a, a new era. Um, things have moved on from the time in Jerusalem. We're now a hundred kilometers away from Jerusalem in the area of Galilee. And looking for key characters, so being the gospel, it's all about Jesus. And it's worth just seeing what uh, John tells us about Jesus in this section. So Jesus is the key character in focus, but um, his disciples are also a key, are key characters. And specifically we see um, Philip. Uh, Jesus is testing him with this question. Um, 
And then we also see another of his disciples, Andrew. So the disciples are also an important character in the story. Um, but in this particular story, so the feeding of the 5,000, so that 5,000, that great crowd, or they more than 5,000, that great crowd are also a character in the story. So we're told that it's 5,000 men. Um, now we can assume that uh, that's just the men, so let's call it uh, another 5,000 women and uh, 10,000 kids. You could easily get to a crowd of, of 20,000 people if families are joining. Everybody's excited about who Jesus is. So this is quite a crowd. So they are your key characters in this specific story. So Jesus, the disciples, and the crowd. And John wants us to know that this crowd are hungry. Now, as this, uh, this miracle is recorded in all of the Gospels, we can um, go and read the other Gospel accounts and see what they, how they help us to understand why this crowd might be hungry. And if you read Mark's account, you see that they had run there. Jesus and his disciples had sailed across the Sea of Galilee while the crowd had run there. We were also told that it's late in the day, so a busy day, uh, running around the lake, getting to Jesus now late in the day. So it's understandable that this crowd are hungry. Now John links this story in with his purpose statements um, from John 20, verse 30 and 31. Uh, so we're told that Jesus did many other signs. But John records specific signs to teach us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him you may have life in his name. Um, Jesus knew the sign that he was going to do. He had in mind what he was going to do. And the sign itself is recorded for us in verse 10 and 11. This massive crowd who only have a couple of fish uh, and five loaves all of them were seated and they ate as much as they wanted. They distributed to this crowd as much as they wanted. They had enough to eat. The supply of food here is lavish. It is abundant. Now importantly, if we remember the context, at the end of chapter 5, um, Jesus had pointed the Jewish leaders to Moses as a witness who was pointing towards him. And this chapter shows in one way how, G how Moses had led the Israelites in the wilderness, how under his leadership they had been fed with manna. Um, here, this prophet like Moses comes. So you can understand why the crowd say, surely this is the prophet who was to come. This prophet was prophesied about um, in Deuteronomy 18. God said that he would raise up a prophet like Moses. And the people had been waiting for this prophet. And now in Jesus, they saw, okay, this one has come. They saw in this uh, miracle that the one they had been waiting for had arrived. We're also told here that the Jewish Passover festival was near. Now, I think that is more than just a, a chronological linking of the story. John is giving us a theological point there, linking it back to the very first Passover, uh, which is recorded in the book of Exodus. So John is wanting our minds to link the story with what we see Moses doing in the book, uh, in the first five books of the Bible, or Exodus through to Deuteronomy at least. And this one like Moses, the prophet who was to come into the world, has now arrived. But he's much more than a prophet like Moses who spoke the word of God. What we saw in chapter 1 of John is that Jesus is indeed the word of God. So the word made flesh. God is with us. And John wants us to see that Jesus is God. This Jesus was there, we're told in John chapter 1, verse 3, that all things were created through him. So we look at this miracle, and Jesus creates bread and fish. 
And we think that is incredible, but we need to remember that this same Jesus had created all things. He had created these 5,000 men and the woman with them and all the children. He had created the mountainside that he was sitting on with his, with his disciples. And so for Jesus to create this bread and fish, enough for all of them, creation in abundance, is just pointing us to the fact that Jesus is God. He is a God who provides. And this meal with this king would have been a phenomenal thing for these disciples and this crowd to have enjoyed with him. But this is pointing us to much bigger than just the fact that Jesus is able to uh, feed hungry tummies. Later in John 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am, a God statement like in Exodus, I am the bread of life. So much more than providing for hungry tummies, Jesus himself came as the bread of life, who would eventually bring life to all those who believed in him as the bread of life was broken on the cross so that people might live. And so this meal with the king points us ahead to the meal that we see Jesus having with his disciples in John 13 through to 17, the the upper room meal, the night before he went to the cross. And at that meal, Jesus also shared a meal, uh, shared bread with his disciples. That was a picture for them, helping them to see that Jesus, the bread of life, would be broken in order to bring life to all people. But even more than this, this story should make us long for that day when all those who believe in Jesus and who have life in his name will sit at the table of the king. Uh, One passage that jumps to mind is Isaiah uh, chapter 25 where we are told of that future great banquet with the king that we are longing for. And in that chapter, we are also told that he will wipe every tear from their eyes, which makes us think of Revelation 21. When the new creation comes, we are waiting for that final banquet meal with the king. That proves, or that is proved right, by the fact that Jesus could provide this bread. He provided his own life is to save us so that one day that future meal with the king will be a reality for all of those who believe in him. So this should blow our minds that this one, this prophet like Moses, is much more than just a prophet. It's understandable that they wanted to make him king because they were expecting a king to come. But his kingdom, as he tells us in chapter 18, is not a kingdom of this world. It's much bigger than that. It's a spiritual kingdom that all those who love Jesus are longing for. And because of Jesus, the bread of life being broken, this miracle points us ahead to that day when all God's people will sit and enjoy that meal with the King, when we are ushered into eternity with Him. So this well-known story growing our view of who Jesus is he is a God, he is God and he provides and he will ultimately uh, provide eternal salvation for those who trust and believe in him life is found in him and this should grow our wonder in who he is so as you teach this to others, as you dig in further, I pray that it would indeed blow your mind as you see the wonder of who Jesus is and what he's done Well, God bless as you dig in further.